So Justin, it's been a learning experience with this mic setup, figuring out the gains. Uh, luckily, Data Robot, there's a video team. So they're always giving me feedback on how and I we are mic started, And we're starting. Hello, everybody. I'm calling from Dublin. We've got somebody. We've got Ben Taylor in the US. Uh, today, we've got Justin Shank, who is in Berlin. And we've got Ganesh uh, Sistu, if I'm not mistaken, will be in Galway. Uh, so we're coming from all parts of the world today. So you're very welcome to our computer vision uh, meetup. And uh, we have Justin Shank, CTO and co-founder of Visio uh, Lab. We've got Ganesh Sistu, computer vision and deep learning expert at Vallejo and Vallejo Vision Systems. We've got Ben Taylor, chief AI evangelist at Data Robot, all going to be sharing some insights within the world of computer vision. And my name is Mark Kelly. I'm the chief customer officer at Aldis International and also founder of AI Ireland. Day to day, I'm an executive search uh, consultant. So we're going to give you a little bit of an overview about the meetup, how it got started, and a little bit about Aldis too. So all this is a recruitment company specializing in AI, data science, and cloud. We've got offices in Dublin and the US, and we service Europe from our Dublin office, and from New York, we service the US. And move forward in artificial intelligence. So we set up all this with the goal of actually setting up a recruitment company that's community driven to actually move forward with an AI and actually add a lot of content and relevant information to allow the industry to move forward and bring different people together. So, so all this, it's ambitious, listeners, we're learners, we've got drive, we're unified and we're specialists. So as I mentioned before, we got two central hubs it's in Brooklyn and in Smithfield. <clears throat> day to day, day to day, our meetups are focused around computer vision, natural language processing, and most recently AI and healthcare. We have meetups that are happening in NLP and computer vision twice a month, and they're focused within the European and the US markets. Before COVID, we were having monthly meetups the first Wednesday of every month in Berlin and Dublin. And the goal was to have them soon in the US. And that's hopefully the plan, uh, please God, in 2021. To give you a little bit of an idea of some of the members breakdown that we have in Dublin and Berlin, that gives an overview of some of the percentages of some of the members. And so far to date, we've had over 40 events, 100 plus speakers, and have had over 7,000 attendees, uh, either in person or virtually. So we set up two podcast series as ways to actually share content within the within the marketplace. The type of content we have, we've got AI in action and we've got AI mentors podcast. AI in action is the application implications and ramifications of AI and how you can actually solve some type of business problem by applying machine learning in it. And guests come on the show and share how they're in their business, they're actually solving some problem that was previously done manually that they now they can actually automate and allow people to work on more effective work. AI Mentors is a podcast series where people talk about their journey within machine learning and data science, how they actually built up their career, some of the challenges they've overcome, some of the ob obstacles, and also advice that they offer to younger people entering into the industry. They also talk about managing a team in data science, managing for re research, and managing return on investment. Because with the very nature of data science, research and investment, return on investment doesn't necessarily correlate well together for people falling down so many different rabbit holes with the very nature of it. <clears throat> We've got over 150 episodes now, and it's one of the fourth most po popular po AI podcasts listened to on iTunes as well, which we're really, really proud of. Day-to-day, <clears throat> -day, we're a recruitment company, and we, as I said, we're serving the Europe and we're serving the US. We're very, very proud of the fact that we're one of the most trusted recruitment companies in the world, and we have over 230 five-star Google reviews as well. So when you come onto Aldis's website, you're going to get a variety, a variety of range of contents. So as I mentioned before, you get the podcast series, the virtual meetup that you're actually watching now, but also you get to find out more about career advice. So maybe it's figuring out how to conduct a, an online interview. It's the skills needed to actually move into natural language processing, amplifying your brand, tips for settling into a new role. We have over 50 articles there for you to interact with and, and reach out to as well. If you're interested in finding out more on these topics, it's on allthis.com slash careers. 
as an AI and data science company, we'll have a variety of different roles within data engineering, cloud, data science, and DevOps. And more, obviously, because of COVID, these roles are remote. So if you're interested in finding out more, please go to info at all this.com or click on to any of the positions, and I'll tell you more details about that as well. <clears throat> so firstly, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And his name is Justin Schenk, co-founder and CTO of Visual Lab. And he's going to speak about learning with limited label data. Visual Lab brings vision-based food recognition to canteens to have a fast, scalable checkouts to make usage for usage simple for canteen owners. Dishes have to be recognized with only a few labeled images, far less than the thousand typically used for image recognition. This talk will highlight how to address this challenge from data automation, automata augmentation strategies and active learning with customer feedback to models trade, trained in the cloud and deployed on the edge. Interesting fact about Justin, while he was in university, himself and some colleagues created an archive of a variety of different languages just to actually make sure that some of the languages and cultures came together and actually presented these as, an, as, a, as accessible for other people to find out more about them. And there's over 40 different cultures and languages on this archive for people to actually uh, relate to. From his time living in Texas, he could see the importance of this from the Mexican culture that that he had there too. Justin, I'm going to pass over to you now and I'm just going to stop sharing my slides. Great. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thank you everyone for coming and checking out the show. So uh, as Mark said, my name is Justin and I'll be giving uh, some background on how we do learning with limited labeled data at Visualab. And uh, so about uh, a bit about me, my background, uh, as uh, as Mark mentioned, I, I was a uh, founder of a website called Open History Project uh, back in the day. And uh, before that, I was doing neuroscience research in the US. So one of the things that got me interested in machine learning generally was there's so much data in the brain and uh, we needed so many uh, different types of algorithms to work with that data that I got really curious about what else we could do with, with these algorithms. And uh, then uh, in 2018, I, I finished a, another master's degree in cognitive science and uh, focused on machine learning and computer vision in Germany and uh, worked in data science and deep learning for companies like Intel and Peltarion. And uh, yeah, Peltarion is building something like, a, something like an AutoML model builder, which, which Ben can tell us more about his experience with these kinds of companies, really cool stuff. And uh, I'm completing a PhD in machine learning with Red Bad University. I uh, recently uh, joined as co-founder and CTO of VisiLab in Berlin. So um, one of my favorite memories as a child was going to canteens with my family every weekend. And we would line up and get ready for, for I would have a chance to pick from many different dishes. And uh, the memory still sticks in my head It's one of one of the most charming uh, dining experiences that I had. And I was also really happy to learn that in Germany, this canteen culture is still very strong in universities and workplaces. So Visual Lab, what we, what we do is we recognize food uh, on an iPad device to recognize the food and to help the customers to pay for it. So it's an automated checkout system uh, based on computer vision. There's a preview of what it looks like. And uh, we could also show a quick video for the use case. So customers will go through the go to the Mensa, the cafeteria, and if you're a student, you would be able to yeah pick out the plate yourself, put it on a tray, and then slide it under the scanner and and do a payment. So that's the idea. And where this really has a personal contact for many people is once you have the once you're able to help people check out with the automated vision solution, you can also help them to get more information about the meals that they're eating. Uh, you basically put the power in their hands to give feedback to canteens, also to check the nutrition by simply taking a, a picture of the food that they're eating that day. And you can also find out information about when that food will be available again. So I'm really excited about those kinds of opportunities. So as Visualab started out, one of the first things, uh, so Tim, my co-founder, uh, was doing was taking pictures of food uh, from different angles. And this was our very early stage of uh, data collection. 
And that's really how, how it is. And we'll talk, talk quite a bit about what kinds of things you need to do to, to, to get your data set large enough so you can learn with limited da data. And for those curious, we did experiment with Jetson Nano and also iPad tablet for UI. So if you go to Google and you ask, how much data do I need to do computer vision uh, image recognition? Uh, so the first answer that pops up is actually quite, I think, quite useful. So it says, at a bare minimum, collect about 1,000 examples. And uh, for most average problems, you should have 10,000 to 100,000 examples. OK. And then for hard problems, try to get up to a million examples of data. For, for deep learning, the more, the better. OK, that's pretty clear. And then and for the, the more complex the problem, the more data you need. So it's super clear that, OK, the harder the, the problem is, the more data you need. And that explains yeah, why these kinds of products are not already on the market. So, so now we, we have an idea of how much data is needed. Let's zoom in a bit on, the, on a canteen chef who wants to be able to create a new dish spontaneously. And he wants the cashier system to recognize that dish and, uh, throughout the day or throughout the next couple days. And he say that this chef will repurpose yesterday's leftovers and make a casserole du jour. So this casserole has never been seen before by our algorithm. How many images do you reckon we would need to be able to recognize this dish? And uh, one way to answer that is to, to think about an example that's very obvious for us. How can you recognize a face again after only having seen it once before? So it's something that's very intuitive for people. It's, it's natural. It's, as far as we know, it's human nature that we are quite good at learning impressions of certain things like faces and able to recognize them later on. The same is true for language. So uh, it's, it's a, an amazing feature for humans to do. And uh, then why isn't it possible for a machine learning algorithm to do the same thing? So the answer, how do we do this? Shots. So a shot here we mean is a reference image. So for example, we talk about k-shot learning. It means we're talking about having only k reference images, so that number of reference images. And in the case of one shot or zero shot, one shot would be you have one image to, to learn from, and zero shots, you have no images to learn from. So let's clarify again what that means. So k-shot learning, you have, the, you have k examples. One shot, you have one example. And in zero shot, you actually don't have any examples, but you know this dish has never been seen before. This is something new. Let's give it a new label. So K shot, uh, zero shot learning is, is the goal for, for us and where we are with, with the AI. Um, learning similarities between items that, that have only been seen once. This would be the one shot learning. Uh, roughly, it's, it's a matter of pairing. When you do the training with the neural network, you pair up images that are this, from the same class or you pair up images from different classes, and you teach the algorithm to recognize that these are same or different. You reward it for, for learning similar uh, classes or punish it, uh, another way to look at it. And then in the test case, on the right, you see that given an image of a basketball, say it's only seen one basketball before, it, it should be able to identify this is a basketball. So. There are some tricks that we can do and, and some applications that are really that make it possible to do this in cases where you have very limited data. So I'll be presenting some of the results from our master thesis student who uh, recently submitted a couple of weeks ago his thesis, Alexis Dracopoulos. Uh, he worked with Visualab on uh, deep metric learning with few shot classification. And uh, here the challenge. Uh, he he faced and he proposed was to uh, to do a full systematic analysis of how many images we would need for different cases, uh, with different types of augmentations we could do, and uh, in this table I hope you can see it. Uh, there's an increasing number of shots that are used. So uh, say you have one image per class or 150 images per class, and comparing different types of uh, pre-trained models in the early stage of, of the pipeline. And uh, I'll, I'll just quickly mention that it's quite interesting how many different factors there are. 
and trying to identify a few shot learning. And so, yeah, we we'll be happy to answer any questions you have about it, but there's so many different types of loss functions, data sets, pre-training, uh, and it's probably, it, yeah, I'll, I'll mention more about this later. So one question that he, that he addressed was, does size matter in terms of the number of images you pre-train your model on? So in, um, if you are recognizing food dishes, for example, you want to make sure that your classifier, the image classifier, can recognize those uh, that casserole, for example. To recognize that casserole, you need to have taught it how to see 100 other casseroles in the past. And hopefully they can uh, to tell the difference between other different types of casseroles. So the more data that the model has seen from similar dishes or other dishes, the the more likely that it can separate any given any two given classes. So in this case, we're looking at as you increase the number of classes. So the classes that it has to identify correctly from, it will we have a decrease in the accuracy, which makes sense. So if there's only one class for uh, for recognizing the uh, be correct, as you add two dishes and say is it casserole or cheeseburger, then it'll be uh, lower, less correct. So ninety percent, about ninety percent accuracy. And then as you increase the number of classes, it gets harder and harder for the algorithm to work. These are the kind of experiments that uh, were done to, to see what, what makes a big difference. And the, the differentiating factor here is uh, the variable, you, you can see the differentiated boxes, was what happens if you increase the amount of data. So in this case, Alexis combined uh, Food 101 with, the, with another data set and created this Food 6993 data set that is, so it has a lot more images in it, a lot more classes. And as you can see, it leads to increased performance. So uh, another trick that can be done, this was also done at VisioLab, was data augmentation. So data augmentation means take your one image, your one reference image. So imagine it's a, a pizza, for example. You have one image of a pizza. Can you do things with that image of the pizza that make it easier to recognize under other circumstances? So say it's not on the plain white tray, as in the top left, but it say it's on a colored speckled tray, as in the middle. And this work was done by our team, our engineer, ML engineer team, to superimpose images onto other trays and backgrounds and in combinations. In fact, all three of these images were synthetically generated uh, using our algorithms and our deep learning pipeline. This allows us to have the highest accuracy for recognizing images under a wide range of settings. So uh, resizing, rotating, shearing, uh, intersection, custom probabilities for classes, motion blurring, image enhancement, glare reduction, everything. So we, we threw all the tools that we could. And uh, probably the most uh, exciting uh, technolo technological advance in the last couple of years, uh, arguably, uh, in deep learning, uh, at least in image data, has been GANs, so Generative Adversarial Networks. And a recent uh, paper, 2019, was exploring how to do uh, food generation with GANs. And to do that, they had like multi-label hierarchical classification of different dishes. So they, they taught the model that uh, fried chicken looks different than fried potatoes. But again, there's some similarities. Grilled chicken looks different than grilled potatoes and so forth. This way, the model is able to learn some of these structural properties that are obvious for people, but uh, unless it's specifically, explicitly taught to uh, to an algorithm, to to uh, a model, uh, would not be recognized. So, Siamese networks are, are one of the another solution uh, that was explored in our in our work. The Siamese networks are looking to compare images that are similar uh, to identify a, a loss uh, metric that can. Uh, minimize the distance between uh, same class items and maximize the, the distance between uh, different class items. So we experiment with that. Also, uh, another result from Alexis's thesis was, what if you could take the, the embedding that's generated by, by uh, passing the image through the neural network, and then to identify it, 
like what's the relationship between these embeddings and a 2D projection? So this was done with UMAP. Um, further, the one of the more uh, kind of maybe obvious once you once you think about it, but uh, also somehow surprising if you've if you've been in the deep learning space, uh, if you've gotten deep into deep learning, is the surprising effect effectiveness of unsupervised learning. So an unsupervised method uh, like k nearest neighbors is uh, performing really well uh, in the case of trying to recognize the similarities between those embeddings. So it's kind of intuitive if, if we go back and take a look and say you are may maybe the furthest left green dot, then the question is what is what are the dots similar to you? What color are they? And if you can tell what are the what are the dishes most similar to you, then you've already kind of answered this one shot learning. So you still have the challenge of making sure that these clusters are, are neatly separated. That's that's where your Siamese net could be useful, for example. But after you've identified that, then you can switch to an unsupervised approach like K-nearest neighbors or LMNN. Um, uh, yeah, further point about the uh, about the GAN from the paper. So when you're using GANs, you're generating images, synthetic data, and and if you can include all the data that you have from ingredients as well as cooking method, uh, taste, all these subjective components uh, or semi-objective components, objective comp components, then you can actually generate data that's based on all that information. So uh, the idea is the more information you can feed to the network, the more data you have on how, uh, how uh, uh, a, a certain dish is being added that day, all the information you have, sorry, uh, will be more useful for the model and help it to generate more realistic uh, images. So here are some examples generated from the paper that I previously mentioned by Wang et al. And uh, th this is the type of research that we're doing at VisuLab, and we're really excited to see where we come in the next few months with this. So I'll quickly say that uh, the take-home point for, for lear learning with limited labeled data some of it is quite obvious. So more data is better. Um, the, the more robust the image classifier that's used, not, this has definitely been proven with FaceNet, for example, trained on millions of face images, uh, now can recognize a person's face with, with only one image with a high accuracy. There's so many different algorithms and tricks you can use, which is why deep learning is often referred to as a black art. Uh, com combining them, trying all of the different variations, or if you're limited in time and resources, like most companies, then you start with what makes the most sense. And uh, try some non-parametric methods like uh, uh, KNN uh, or uh, also SVM, sorry, rather unsupervised methods, as well as state of the art, and see how, see how these methods compare. So the references, including Alexis's thesis and some of the images are provided here. And uh, we'll say that's it. Thanks a lot. Justin, thank you very much for that. That was very, 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 very helpful. So for now, we're gonna speak, to, we're gonna speak uh, with Ganesh Sistu, a computer, computer vision and deep learning expert at Vallejo Vision Systems. And Ganesh, his title is How Deep Learning is Playing a Crucial Role in Advanced Autom Autonomous Driving Applications. Ganesh will present how deep learning is playing a crucial role in advanced autonomous driving applications like object detection, semantic segmentation, motion estimation, and camera lens disturbance detection. He will also give an overview of how they build fisheye camera based visual perception solutions for automated parking systems to present the complex life cycle of deep learning projects. I had the pleasure of going down to Vallejo Vision Systems probably over a year ago now and actually getting to see under the hood how they, how they do this and how they're actually applying deep learning on some of the solutions. So you're in for an absolute treat here. Ganesh, over to yourself. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just to give you a heads up, I have multiple screens. So sometimes I'll be looking here and there, but still I'll be focusing. Okay. Uh, 
I'm Ganesh Sishtu, Computer Vision Expert from Value Vision Systems Ireland. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, some of our research activities on deep visual perception and how we are uh, building level 2 or level 3 autonomous driving systems in Value Ireland. Uh, so here are the few uh, highlights of a uh, few important topics we are going to discuss in the talk. Uh, first, I'll introduce uh, what we, what, who we are, what we do at Value Vision Systems, and I'll give a quick brief, a quick overview of autonomous driving, visual perception, and surround your systems, so that it sets the right tone uh, to understand our research work uh, in these areas. And finally, I'll present a one slide on uh, how deep deep learning based ecosystem looks like in real world projects. So Va <clears throat> Value is a global automotive supplier and a, and a trusted partner for automakers around the world uh, with over 18 billion euro sales and 100,000 employees. Uh, we, are, we have footprints in 33 countries. And in modern era, our main focus is uh, in three areas, uh, electric vehicles, mobility and di digitalization, and autonomous driving. And we have four coherent business groups, uh, visibility systems, powertrain systems, comfort and driving assistance systems, and thermal systems. And I'm from uh, comfort and driving assistance. Coming to Value Ireland, uh, we uh, value uh, Value Vision Systems uh, is part of uh, Value Global Group, and we are 600 plus employees, and we are quite diverse in nationalities. Uh, we have employees from 29 con different countries, and our team is quite aggressive in patenting as well. On average, we file more than 100 patents per year. <clears throat> so. SA has uh, five levels of autonomous. SA defined autonomous driving as five levels, uh, where uh, the first three levels are uh, kind uh, are autonomous driving area levels where the human is the uh, kind of main responsible person uh, when there is a conflict situation or when there's uh, when the when the vehicle when the algorithms fail to automate the vehicle. But in the in the case of level four and level five. The algorithms has to take the responsibility of the safety of the passengers as well as the driver. And in, in level zero to three, um, it's kind of uh, recommended that the person always have hands near the steering and braking, uh, near the steering and uh, be alert. But from level four and level five, uh, drivers can keep their mind off, especially in level five, there won't be any uh, steering as well for human control. And the way we understand the world around the car is uh, is via sensors, and there are different kinds of sensors, starting from cameras, ultrasonics, radars, lidars, and all. And and each sensor has its uh, has a different purpose. Uh, though there is a huge uh, debate on whether do we need lidars or not, uh, but ev univocally everyone accepts that cameras are essential for autonomous driving. So where do we keep these sensors? Where do we de where do we keep the cameras on the car? It purely depends upon the application you are building on the the vehicle, the purpose of the camera. So for example, uh, there are, if the camera is placed on the windshield, it's called a front front facing camera. It's usually used for uh, highway driving kind of applications. But if you if you place the cameras. Uh, cameras in a surround view position somewhere on the mirrors. Uh, it is for uh, somewhere on the mirrors. It is for um, lane keep assistant kind of applications. And if the cameras usually placed at a lower side on the ba uh, back side of the car, uh, then it is for reverse maneuvering uh, assistance. So in case when we are reversing a heavy vehicle, we may we might miss our kids or um, our, our pedestrians sometimes during the evening, uh, during the low light conditions and all. So it is quite helpful. Uh, a reverse camera is quite helpful uh, in these cases. So autonomous driving has uh, five different, uh, five basic building blocks. Uh, one is sensing, uh, the one is perception, localization, abstraction, planning, and controlling. Sensing involves absorbing the information around the vehicle via different sensors, as I said earlier, cameras, sliders, ultrasonics, etc. And perception localization is uh, making sense of this dense data around the vehicle because you're capturing uh, 
gigabytes of data with lidars cameras and other sensors and we have to uh, absorb the i mean absorb the semantics out of it um, so that's what the perception do uh, and if you use cameras that perception is usually termed as visual perception and localization is a vehicle's own ability to locate its position in the world uh, so this can be done with standard sensors like differential gps or uh, or we can use even cameras to um, even cameras and 3d uh, 3d reconstruction techniques to uh, localize the vehicle uh, and a standard way of doing this is using hd maps or google maps kind of thing and abstraction is again uh, we get information from different sensors like visual perception lidar based perception and localization information and we have to stitch all this information together and make it available in a simplistic form so that uh, the the algorithms behind the behind your modern car can plan the maneuvering so once we have a simplistic representation of the information of the data around the car, uh, planning algorithms usually follow driving policies and plan the source to na uh, destination path. And uh, control unity is nothing but con uh, converting these uh, digital instructions into uh, mechanical movements of the car, like acceleration, brake, steering angle, etc. So there's an alternative approach called an end-to-end -end approach uh, where uh, all these things are are implicitly modeled so we don't use any uh, we don't use any subsystems instead we expect a neural network to learn all these representations representations inherently so as i said earlier uh, if we are using cameras for visual perception uh, perception that's called, that's termed as visual perception and if it is driven by you and if your visual perception pipeline is driven by deep learning we term it as deep visual perception so deep vis the visual perception module consists of quite a number of tasks and it's computationally quite expensive as well uh, and it's quite diversified diverse as well for example visual perception have tasks like 2d bonding box uh, semantic segmentation 3d bonding box motion estimation depth estimation and um, vehicle pose estimation etc uh, but those are very known tasks we've been we we would have heard in uh, news articles and pip and news articles and tv tv interviews about these things uh, how deep learning has revolutionized all these tasks but there are lesser known tasks something like uh, lens uh, soiling detection so especially in case of level four and level five as i said earlier the safety of the passengers falls under the hands of the algorithms so if there is a blockage on the lens the algorithms has to uh, understand that the lens got blocked by some soiling, mud, or water droplets, and they should be able to clean the s cameras themselves. And other other interesting topic is domain adaptation, uh, where uh, where we have synthetic data, where we have where we use synthetic data to replicate conditions that cannot be replicated in real world. Uh, and we try to use domain adaptation algorithms to to make the ne neural networks uh, understand those conditions in real world, or replicate the behavior uh, that it learned on synthetic data in real world. So, as I said earlier, there are quite a number of tasks uh, in literature in, in in academy. You would have seen uh, you would have seen that uh, each each. Each task might have a dedicated neural network, uh, for example, 2D bonding box, YOLO, faster RCNN, and all. Uh, for semantic segmentation, deep lab, or FPN, FPN networks, uh, PSP nets. Uh, so, but the thing is that uh, on a hardware, on a on a single ECU, when you want to solve all these problems, you can't uh, deploy one one neural network for one one task. So, a smart way would be to uh, make build one new, big neural network and make it to learn all these tasks. So technically, this term this is called multitask learning, and multitask learning is nothing but uh, making a network to learn multiple tasks at the same time. And uh, and there are different ways you can make a neural net. You can design a neural network to perform multitask learning. Uh, for example, you it can have a layer sharing technique you can use layer sharing technique where there will be a common set of layers initially but uh, there will be dedicated uh, de dedicated layers of dedicated for each task and otherwise you can use different neural networks but uh, share the knowledge between those neural net those neural networks 
and make the make them more robust otherwise we can use something like a hier hierarchical representation like some tasks will have lesser number of layers some task might need more complex uh, more deeper networks and some task need more and more deeper layers uh, have <clears throat> and these 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 architectures can be hand hand designed or or we can use evolutionary algorithms or network architecture search algorithms or even reinforcement learning techniques to uh, come up with dynamic architectures uh, i will talk about evolutionary algorithms uh, and how we are using it in value um, in later slides So a typical nomenclature for this is that we call this as an encoder and we call these as decoders. So in this case, uh, this is a single encoder, three task decoder network. Uh, this, uh, this nomenclature is uh, quite, quite useful for us in later stages to explain the complex topics in a simpler way. Okay, uh, in Value Ireland, we are we are uh, uh, we are the center for excellence in fisheye surround view systems and visual perception. So, as I said earlier, cameras can be placed at uh, anywhere on the car based on the applications. Uh, what we do in surround view systems is that we place uh, four cameras, uh, four to five cameras around the car, and these cameras are fisheye cameras fisheye lens cameras, uh, and usually have more than 180 degrees of field of view nearly 190 200 degrees field of view and with with four cameras we we can cover 360 degrees around the vehicle and the main I mean the main goal is to analyze what is around the vehicle within 10 to 20 meters from the vehicle but not like far beyond that but uh, if you place fish cam, if you use fish cameras for getting large field of view, uh, and with just four cameras, if you want to get a 360 degrees perception, um, you have to pay a little price uh, from computational complexity wise because uh, fish cameras introduce uh, nonlinear distortion, also called radial distortion. So you need to correct that radial distortion and do the processing. Otherwise, you can even work on radio uh, fish image directly. Um, modern uh, in recent times, um, the the direction towards working on native fish MS uh, is increasing and attracting more and more people actually. Okay, uh, to, uh, I'm going to present research activities uh, that uh, that we that we are doing in Value Tune, especially activities that uh, I am directly involved. As I said earlier. Uh, Developing one one single uh, double developing dedicated neural networks for each task in a visual perception pipeline is uh, kind of not practical, especially for low power hardware, uh, which we use in level two and level three vehicles. So, an an alternative solution and an efficient solution, in fact, is multitask learning. So. Here you can see that there are two detection, there are two networks, segmentation and detection network. What we did here was uh, we 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 removed two, uh, we converted this two task network into a single task network. So there's a common encoder and dedicated decoders. Uh, this is this is what we have seen uh, in previous slides. So what we did is that in, in Usually the encoder will have the higher footprint, like uh, highest footprint. Uh, it's computationally expensive. It will have so many layers. Common encoders we know um, are like ResNet 50, Res, ResNet 50 or VGG16. All these are encoders. Uh, if you cut out the last fully connected layers and common decoders are like uh, for segmentation, uh, upscaling, deconvolution layers. These are kind of uh, layers that you see in decoders in segmentation. And common decoders are kind of like YOLO style of re regressing for the boxes or SSD style of regressing for boxes, etc. So the advantage of this uh, converting a two task network into single task network is that you can save up to 50% of computational complexity, but uh, with little, little or no loss in KPIs, uh, what I mean, with little or no loss in metrics like accuracy uh, and all. So, <clears throat> And another thing is that uh, we we work on level level three and level uh, level three and level four systems. Uh, so we we don't have a luxury of running a hundred layer neural networks or a two hundred layer neural networks. So usually we we build efficient neural networks uh, which have which are within like 18, 20 layers at max. 
but hardware hardware is getting more and more powerful so soon we'll be building uh, soon we'll be using more bigger and bigger networks for even for level 3 and level 2 so another work uh, is uh, in this slide in the previous slide here i presented uh, how we converted a single task network to a two task network uh, and we extended this work instead of two tasks now we tested with three tasks and instead of testing on a public data set as kitty or uh, cityscapes uh, we tested on our own data set uh, values values uh, autonomous driving data set which has nearly 50000 images for detection segmentation and lens blockage detection so these are the three tasks we we learned using a single network uh, in this work and you can see that compared to single task networks the performance almost remains the same but with a gain of uh, nearly 50 to 60% uh, in computational complexity as well as number of parameters reduces in the network so another work another interesting set of work is related to improving the performance of semantic segmentation uh, so in general if you want to improve the performance of semantic segmentation network uh, there are three common strategies you can follow you can increase the model complexity for example you can add skip connections hierarchical models you can add crfs or you can even use um, temporal information or uh, the other way around to increase the performance of a semantic segmentation network is by increasing the supervision you can learn auxiliary tasks or you can you can use even domain adaptation by and you can increase the supervision uh, the other way of doing increasing the performance of semantic segmentation networks is working with fundamental blocks uh, like replacing the simple um, bilinear interpolation layers with peak convolution layers or dilated convolution layers and etc so the next set of couple of works i'm going to show uh, they are fo mainly focused on making use of temporal information and auxiliary information so what we did is it, this is a standard semantic segmentation network uh, something like segnet uh, unit and all so we we it takes an image and it passes through an encoder encoder extracts all the useful higher level features and the decoder uh, extract information specific to the tasks of uh, semantic segmentation in this case so instead of you know, instead of passing one frame we pass two frames and then we pass three frames uh, at a definite time uh, at a different time time stamps and we measured the, we kept the same architecture the encoders are same decoders are same uh, and the way we fuse the features is different uh, for different networks for example a simple feature fusion is like sum of the layers and another feature fusion is concatenation of the layers another way is like using a recurrent network like something like lstm uh, here so we tried all the three and an interesting thing here is that the encoders are the same that means uh, they take different images but they share the same weights so the the model complexity won't increase much because the encoders are like literally sharing the weights and we have so we have shown that uh, using uh, using this kind of temporal information actually improves the performance of the network uh, and this temporal information just uh, pro both processing and the computation complexity and the parameters comes for free because the weights getting shared and and every image ha in the autonomous driving pipe camera pipeline has to pass to the encoder there is no other alternative and an interesting work uh, is uh, is that we extended this work further and to three tasks and we co we come up with an architecture which shares uh, features across all the three tasks uh, and we also proposed a, ta a new loss function uh, called a geometric loss function so a standard standard way of doing loss functions in a multitask learning style is that just sum the loss functions individual loss functions but uh, so it's a arithmetic mean instead we said like if you have a geometric mean you you can learn uh, your learning happens much smoothly but the tasks here is quite different from the other one previously it was detection segmentation and lens blockage now here it is like segmentation depth and motion and another task as i said earlier to improve the semantic segmentation you can use temporal information or you can use auxiliary tasks so in this work what we did is uh, instead of 
while uh, we what we've shown is that if you want to learn semantic segmentation if you learn depth along with the segmentation your performance of the segmentation network also improves that's the main concept behind this work and we also proposed two different class functions uh, one is a uh, again, uh, a, ge a geometric mean. Uh, other one is uh, a focused LASK for a task. So if your main task is segmentation, uh, use this loss function. And if your main task is, and and the depth is just a guiding task, you can use a loss function, something like this. But if, if, your main function, if your main task is learning depth and segmentation is just to support depth, then you can just uh, inverse the seg with depth and you get a new loss function. So while building these multitask learning networks, we realize that there are different ways we can model the loss functions. We can weight the loss functions in differently. So we extended our work and we benchmarked uh, different, uh, almost all the state of the art algorithms on multitask learning task weighting. So we we these are the two the the one highlighted in the green color are the two works I I previously showed you. This is Multinet plus plus our previous paper, and this is Dynamic Scaling Oxnet our previous paper. So other than that, there are state of the art ways to do this uh, task weighting in a multitask setup. Uh, we benchmark all of them, but we we experienced uh, we experienced that when we are scaling up this to five tasks or six tasks majority of the methods are failing or struggling. <clears throat> so what we did is that uh, we come up with a kind of a, a, a kind of a hybrid method between a meta learning and asynchronous back propagation. So <clears throat> meta, uh, we used uh, evolutionary algorithms, as I said earlier, uh, to, uh, to come up with the optimal parameters uh, for the weights between the different task losses. But uh, evolutionary algorithms are usually slow. It takes a lot of time. So we uh, we used few uh, tricks like uh, early stopping and all, and soft weight transfer. Uh, more is discussed. Uh, more details are discussed in our paper. <clears throat> and we also used uh, something called asynchronous back propagation so, uh, technique to uh, along with this meta along with the evolutionary methods uh, to speed up this process. So. Computationally expensive, but the but the good thing is we run usually we run these uh, algorithms usually on a eight GPU machine or a uh, ten GPU machine so that it it will be much faster and uh, and it can be done in a parallel fashion. Uh, so. As again, evolutionary. A quick slide on evolutionary algorithms. They, they, it's a standard. Uh, it's a standard genetic algorithm. Of the, the algorithm works in a standard genetic algorithm way. Uh, so we, we choose the initial population. We evaluate uh, the each pop each uh, people's fitness using a fitness function, and we select the strongest population subpopulation out of it, uh, and we do a little bit of mutation and and repeat the same process again and again. Uh, I, I showed you about multitask learning in uh, multiple tasks, two tasks, three tasks, auxiliary learning. Now, another interesting work I'm involved in is multi-sensor learning. So one of the complex issue uh, with camera-based perception is that during the nighttime, it's almost all impossible for any algorithm to detect objects or lanes and, or, or any, block, any, any uh, blockage in front of the vehicle. So what we did here is that uh, we used, we combined it two sensors, LiDAR and camera. So from the LiDAR, we extracted the image and we passed through a, something called a flow net, flow net. So what flow net will do is that uh, it, will, it will get the motion vectors in the image, a couple of, in a series of images. So we pass the Im uh, camera image through flow net. We pass the LiDAR image to LiDAR flow net, which will generate the flow vectors for LiDAR. And then uh, we pass the same set of images through a RGB feature extractor. So the basic, this feature extractor is kind of a extract the important features like image features. So you can consider this as a pre-trained network on ImageNet. So all this, all this uh, information is fused and passed to a segmentation decoder, a motion segmentation decoder to figure it out, uh, which are the objects moving in low light. So, we have seen a tremendous uh, improvement in the performance because uh, we because lidar is not sensitive to light uh, it works even at uh, dark uh, even dark bag dark areas um, but the cam but it is sparse but camera is sensitive to, sensitive to light 
but it works, but it is quite dense. So we, we uh, fused dense information and sparse information together to uh, figure it out uh, objects in under low light conditions. Unfortunately, we don't have a public data set uh, which has low light image, daylight image, and LiDAR as well. So what we did is we took the Kitty data set, the open source data set. We used a unit. Uh, it's a GAN, uh, unsupervised image, image to image translation network, uh, to convert the day image to uh, night image. Uh, to train this GAN, we used BDD data set, Berkeley Deep Drive data set, because that is the only data set with day image and night image. So we trained it on BDD data set. We converted Kitty data to night data, and then we trained the whole network uh, to show that sensor fusion actually is, is an efficient technique to handle these kind of cases. Uh, another interesting case in visual perception is uh, uh, understanding the blockage on the lens. So one of the one of the serious concern with the surrounding cameras is that a windshield camera is behind the window, front window, and it is always protected. Uh, but uh, the surrounding cameras are uh, are outside the car are outside, and they they are exposed to extreme weather conditions, uh, and there are higher chances that um, they get uh, blocked by mud or water droplets and all. So uh, recognizing these kind of patterns on the lens is 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 also a challenging task. So <clears throat> what we did initially was that uh, we, we trained a three-task network uh, to, to recognize the uh, blockage on the lens. But what we observed is that when we collected the data, majority of the data is from, um, is from the rural area because you cannot expect you cannot expect uh, that you you can collect a muddy data uh, muddy data set when you are running your car in Dublin or London uh, unless you you put a lot of mud on your car and drive it around the city. Uh, so that so what we did is that uh, an interesting technique we ap applied here is that we use cycle GAN uh, and and uh, converted the and used uh, clean city data and muddy muddy rural or, uh, or countryside data and we can we we transferred the patterns of soiling and water droplets onto the city data so this way uh, this way we are able to generate our data for free and we don't need to uh, when we reduce the efforts of manual annotation and <clears throat> manual annotation a lot because you, you kind of come the entire data comes for free for you this we published in last year ITSC. Uh, but while working on this data, we also observed that. Uh, <clears throat> but for the production, we usually don't use uh, synthetic data. We use uh, uh, annotated data, uh, which which goes through a rigorous rigorous uh, testing, with, to make sure that there won't be any errors in the annotation. But what we observed is that no matter how much testing you do, there's always a confusion between what is soiled pixel and what is not a soiled pixel. So here are the example. For example, annotators thought that everything in this region, white, white color uh, in this, uh, everything, annotators thought that um, only these pixels are not soiled pixels in this image. And annotators thought that only these pixels are soiled pixels in these regions. But if you see here, uh, there are certain pixels which are not soiled, but it is highly impossible to manually annotate uh, at that finite level. So usually annotators draw a block over here. Uh, so uh, it, this is the same case here. Usually annotators are just drawing the big block over here, though these pixels are not soiled actually. So then <clears throat> the idea we had is that uh, then why can't we improve this, uh, the noisy annotations and make them much better? Uh, we, we tried initially cycle GAN. Uh, we give a lot of soil data. We give a lot of clean data to the net cycle GAN and we try to uh, and we try to um, we try to generate the patterns, soiling patterns, and learn the soiling patterns, clean the annotation, but it never worked because CycleGAN works. CycleGAN not only changes the patterns of soiling, but it is also changing the background pattern. If there is a pedestrian standing over there, all of a sudden it's removing the pedestrian. If if there is a lane marking, it was removing the lane marking. So what we did is that uh, we 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 converted this process into a two-stage process. We distangled, uh, distangled the uh, shape representation of the soiling uh, from the background back image representation. So what we did is that we used a variational autoencoder first to learn the uh, shape of the soiling. What are the different shapes of soiling it could be? 
uh, and then we used a cycle again, a very similar technique like cycle consistency, um, like cycle again, uh, to put these learned soiling shapes, uh, binary shapes, and add the texture to these binary shapes and put it on the image. So this is a two-stage process. The variational autoencoder encoder helps us to learn different patterns of different shapes of soiling, whereas the cycle again helps us to uh, apply the texture on top of those shapes. So, and this two-stage process really helped us give us uh, quite uh, quite a quite efficient results compared to standard GAN-based techniques. Sorry for that. And with all these with all these knowledge, with all these understandings, we we went forward and we we were able to now build a single network for almost every visual almost all the visual perception tasks a single network to handle or uh, perform six different tasks. Uh, and with all the learnings from uh, evolutionary algorithms, with all these learnings from the soiling, uh, generative adversarial networks and all, uh, we are able to build a, a sophisticated six task neural network that can do uh, object detection, road segmentation, lane segmentation, and moving object detection. And the depth estimation, dense depth estimation for 3D reconstruction, and even six degrees of pose as well. Um, and of course, uh, one of the complex tasks, soiling and lens blocking detection. And this is one of the output from our from our six task network. A single image goes through the network. This, uh, that six task network is detecting uh, Estimating how far a pedestrian, how far a car is, how far a pedestrian is, uh, in real world coordinates, uh, not just in pixels, uh, and uh, it's also able to segment out the cars, lanes, and all, and also recognize which are moving, which are not moving, and draw bounding boxes. Okay, uh, last we'll go to the last and final slide. Uh, here I'm going to explain you, uh, just show you a life cycle of of deep learning pro project from algorithm algorithm perspective only. So if you are building a deep learning model, it's not just about building the deep learning model. If you are going to the production, um, like I said, like all the model, most of the models I showed, they, are, they all they are all targeted for the production. So if you're working production as your goal, make sure that uh, not just the network, uh, building the network you focus on, but you also focus on uh, meta learning, data augmentation, uh, op um, even network optimization and different training strategies. Um, as um, as we have seen in the previous task, data augmentation is a, is is really helping nowadays. Like especially, uh, GANs are helping a lot for us to solve the problems, and network architecture search is another important area. If you have uh, if you have freedom of com uh, if you have freedom with uh, large scale uh, servers with you. Uh, you can you can first you can ask your developers to first come up with a skeleton architecture, approximate architecture, and um, and run few architecture search algorithms to optimize the uh, network further. And pruning is another important and another important concept. Uh, now PyTorch has uh, inbuilt APIs to do that. Uh, TensorFlow is also coming up with these inbuilt APIs and quantization as well. And as I said earlier, we, we have seen an auxiliary learning. And another important technique is the hard negative mining. Uh, one of the problem is that once you deploy the model, uh, the the test engineers drive somewhere in uh, somewhere in Germany, somewhere in uh, somewhere in um, California or something, and come up with cases where the algorithm is not working. Uh, so you have to you have to understand how to solve those uh, failure cases, and update your so update your neural network and make a new release. So hard negative mining is another important concept in these cases. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Ganesh, thank you very much for your time today. You made such a complicated uh, talk, very, very straightforward. You can see that you're truly an expert in this area and you've done a lot of different work in it. So thank you very much. We will be having questions after Ben's talk. <clears throat> so I'll be sharing questions. So please uh, stick around for that. And our final speaker is Ben Taylor, uh, Chief AI Evangelist at Data Robot. And Ben's title of the talk is Teaching CV Systems to Learn and Comprehend Like a Human. As AI workloads have expanded beyond experimental notebooks, 
Data Robot has developed a data ingest and ML ops to ensure trust and reliability for the enterprise. In his talk, Ben will explore some of the storytelling methods that work for deep learning and discuss their work in computer vision and deep learning. He'll also explore the concept of intelligence and a better Turing test for machines that finally think. It's a pretty big statement there, Ben. So uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Ben in person. I think it was over a year ago now when he, when he flew over for the Dublin Tech Summit and he's also been a previous guest on the podcast. So we're delighted to actually have you here today, Ben. So over to yourself. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Can you guys see my screen? <clears throat> Perfect. I can see your screen perfect as well. Awesome. You'll, you'll probably notice the my image. I've put an ear and removed an eye. And this is kind of foreshadowing for some of the issues that exist with deep learning today where our current systems would not react to this very well. Uh, so first off, I love skiing. I took this picture last year. If anyone listening is ever in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, fantastic place to ski. I do a lot of backcountry skiing. If For people that don't know the area, it is where Qualtrics is from. So SAP purchased Qualtrics for $8 billion a year or two, yeah, two years ago out of this area. So we call it Silicon Slopes, which is a little cheesy. You've got a lot of You've got Silicon Forest in Oregon, Silicon Hills in Austin. A lot of people are trying to rebrand their own Silicon Valleys. But Utah's been doing a great job with tech. Um, a fun fact about me that's maybe a little strange. I made national news when I decided to live in the woods when I went to college. Uh, so I lived in the snow full time. Uh, I, I don't really know why. I think I was just kind of curious and I wanted the, the challenge. If anyone's curious, you can scan this QR code and it'll pull up a YouTube video from the news. Uh, my parents were quite embarrassed about it because you had the media trying to contact my dad, who's a doctor, and my mom, who's a lawyer, to ask why their son was homeless living in the snow. Uh, had a comment from the university president about it, and I became a celebrity on campus, and this is before social media. So it, it it's kind of strange because I... College kids are very impressionable. Uh, they're pretty easy to influence. Not that I was trying to, but anything I said was profound. And I had a lot of college kids that would reach out to ask life questions and and really understand why I was doing this. Um, and, and I think maybe the theme is I, I kind of enjoy doing things that are less normal and I don't really respect social boundaries or research boundaries. So this is my career in a single slide. I studied chemical engineering with an emphasis in biomedical, uh, did a senior research project with Genentech in the Bay Area. I got into computer programming, learned the LAMP stack, uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Uh, I had a, a web e-commerce store in 2003 where I was shipping climbing gear uh, while I was going to school. I learned computer vision. I worked for the Desert Research Institute doing algae CI algae concentration in Antarctic sea ice using uh, different satellite data sets and merging them together. I continued my obsession with computer vision when I went to graduate school, also for chemical engineering, focused on nanotechnology. So imaging gold nanoparticles and pulling out particle statistics. And, and these are all things that are pretty classical. They, they're they well well documented approaches using watershed and other thresholding methods where deep learning was not required to to do very useful things with computer vision. I joined Intel and Micron. I worked for them for five years. I worked in departments like photolithography, metrology, process control, fault detection, and yield analysis. So I had a really good sampling of what it felt like to work inside a semiconductor manufacturing plant. And this was a NAND flash memory plant. And it was also the plant that spearheaded Intel's Optane memory that they have available today. I joined the dark side, went and worked for a hedge fund as a quant, which is slang for quantitative analyst. This was in 2012. We built out a 600 GPU cluster in the office, which was insane. Even today, that would be insane. But in 2012, it was Wolf on Wall Street. I did that for a year. And at the wise request of my wife, I, I got a different job because she wasn't seeing me very much. I was working all the time. And I worked, got a job at a Sequoia company called HireVue, and I was their chief data scientist. So I built out their, their data science team and helped them deliver their first AI product to market. I, I really liked this experience because I love the executive team. 
I actually fell in love with HR because it's very complicated. You have to deal with AI ethics, racism, sexism, ageism, all sorts of biases that humans bring along for the ride. We call that your unconscious bias. A lot of people are not intentionally evil, but based on our experiences, we can propagate biases that we're not even familiar with. And so we did a lot of really good work there. Uh, we also did have some bad press. You can search for the Wall Street Journal did a hit piece called The Robots Are Hiring. I know The Washington Post has done a piece. I've been involved with some of those Black Mirror Twitter storms, Reddit storms. Uh, but really, deep down under the hood, Higher View has really led the charge for um, leading with AI adverse impact mitigation. And and I if I'd love to start a conversation on the side, I I'd be I think you'd be very hard pressed to find a company that has done more innovation on this topic. Um, I got the itch to do a startup, so I co-founded Zeph.ai. We focused on AutoML deep learning. We got into multimodal models and building models with multiple targets and mixing data sets, uh, video, audio, text structured into single models. We were the sixth acquisition uh, just this year for Data Robot. Uh, so please check out this vision demo. They're actually using one of the data sets that we brought over with the acquisition. And it's quite impressive to see what they can do with an AutoML pipeline today. Here we go. Okay. So I met Jeremy, the CEO of Data Robot, a couple of years ago, and he was describing this big vision where he wanted to have the entire machine learning pipeline in a single product. So literally from A, data preparation and gathering, all the way to AutoML building models to deployment applications and ML ops. And I think two years ago, I thought that's insane. You you will fail. You can't be the expert at everything. You need to kind of double down on one thing. But I think Jeremy is a very special character to be leading a robot. And sure enough, he is succeeding. So he is succeeding through acquisitions where he is buying companies uh, to fill this pipeline. So Data Robot has done a fantastic job at delivering an A to Z machine learning uh, platform that's really built for the enterprise. Uh, so what am I doing inside Data Robot? So I'm the chief AI evangelist. I'm very excited to launch this podcast that just launched. We haven't had a press release on it yet. We did a soft launch last week where it's, it's called A More Intelligent Tomorrow. We're interviewing a lot of executives. We had Congressman Will Hurd on, who's led the charge in the US for AI. Uh, we've ha had M Michael Kanan on. He ran, he helped run AI for the US Air Force. Uh, we've got some fantastic guests. So we've done, I think, 15 episodes now. Uh, three have been released. So something to check out. There's a QR code there. Um, the other thing I'm really excited about inside Data Robot is this evangelism piece and evangelism might feel a little, a little weird and silly, especially in a technical talk because it feels like marketing and a lot of marketing feels like bullshit. So why, why would he care about evangelism? So the way I see evangelism is it's really research that's marketing directed. So I do report up into marketing and the research that we're working on is stuff that inspires stuff that gets attention and stuff that doesn't necessarily have to be supported in the product. And so uh, working on a bunch of different projects right now, one of them is demonstrating bat vision. Can I see the world with sound? Uh, doing some stuff with plants. Um, can I automatically water plants using computer vision? Uh, play, I just got a laser that I'm playing with that is 3,000 times more powerful than a lot of the, the legal limits that exist in the countries that you... A lot of the people listening come from, and we're going to be burning weeds with it. So we we have a lot of really fun projects and some other projects that I can't share publicly yet that are coming out of this evangelism group. So AI storytelling. So this is kind of the meat of the talk. Uh, I am throwing in a disclaimer here. I've got hashtag Ben's AI junk drawer. That allows me to share some things with you that are not attached to Data Robot. These are personal items that came previously through the acquisition, uh, this allows me to be a little bit more controversial and share things that I think are interesting. So um, what is this? So you already answered the question before I could ask it. In 100 milliseconds, your brain said that's a hummingbird. And if I asked you why, you would say the beak and the wings. And sure enough, looking at grad cam activations with deep learning, it agrees, it concurs. So deep learning can also show you 
why it believes something is a thing. And you can do this with classifications, regressions, segmentations, anything that is using deep learning, you can visualize activations and begin to tell a story. So this story is straightforward, but what about this one? So if I asked you, this is Kira Knightley, she's a famous actress, uh, is Kira Knightley attractive? So if I ask that question, it then becomes very complicated because as a human brain, you may agree with me. And if you don't agree with me individually, a panel of people would probably would agree with me that she is attractive, but why? It turns out that grad cam visualizations will actually show you areas of the face that are of interest. So bottom of the nose, lips and the eye, they turn out to be plastic or common areas of plastic surgery modification points. And so the point of this slide is to really kind of show an edge that deep learning has where it can begin to tell stories that not even humans can tell with our own brains. So whether it's in medicine, manufacturing QA, whatever the application, the things that are easy, like a hummingbird, it can concur with, uh, but the things that are hard, it can begin to give insights. So another fun example, this is a computer vision talk, but I also want to sneak in audio and video because you can visualize them as images. And we'll get into that. So suppose in the future, you have a mother droid, which you see on the left, and she's taking her son droid to a football game. And these fans are pretty unruly. You know, they're drinking a lot of alcohol and they're going to be swearing. So it's really important that we can build an F word detector for this mother droid because she needs to save her son from learning these terrible words. So if we take the wolf on Wall Street, which is close, it's three hours, and we divide that into 110,000 one second chunks with a 0.1 second slider. And then if we take all the F words, you can find these on YouTube. Someone has done the hard work of editing just the F words. Uh, this, I think this set the record when the movie first came out for the most F words in a public movie. Uh, so there's three and a half minutes of pure F words. And we can take 10,000 one second chunks and we have a training set. So it wasn't very hard, wasn't a lot of human work. Someone else did the work. We can have a training set for the F word. And the story I'm continuing is I can take the raw audio and I can make an image. You see this image with the orange and kind of the purple in the middle. That's a spectrogram. Uh, you're looking at time and frequency. I can then apply grad cam visualizations to the spectrogram, which are nonsensical to a human brain. We don't really think in spectrograms. That's not how we evolved. But if I look at accumulations in time where the spectrogram is activating, I can actually get some pretty cool localization with where the F word is said. So you can see this down below uh, with what is being said in the F word. It's, it's getting the neighborhood right with where the F word is being said. And here you see it again here that it's also getting, it's getting it right with the neighborhood that's being said. And so what, who cares? The, the takeaway from this is actually pretty significant. So the takeaway is doing audio for someone who's dealt with automatic speech recognition is unbelievably expensive. It is so expensive to do automatic speech recognition. And so something that you are very sensitive to is your slider. And so when I'm saying a 0.1 second slide, that is extremely coarse. A lot of times with speech recognition, we talk about a 10 millisecond slide. And so with some of these uh, grad cam visualizations, they potentially allow you to do word or area of interest segmentation with a much cheaper inference. Uh, this is a one slide example of how video can be consumed. I, I really like Ganesh's talk where he is demonstrating where you can take different temporal events and, and video gets very, very complicated. So I don't want to belittle the complexity that video brings to the table, but something like a ring camera or security camera, if I know you have a 30 second clip or a 60 second max recording, I can actually represent that as an image where you can see the flow, the temporal flow is represented with a color map. Uh, the car arrives. So just looking at this image, I can I can glance at it and quickly tell you once you know how to read these that the car arrived, driver got out, driver spent time probably dealing with kids, passenger got out after the driver, driver's dealing with kids, and young child ended up on the left. And then the question to the audience is, why are the trees white? Well, the reason the trees are white is there was no temporal direction and the wind was blowing. So you can see there's a lot of information that comes out of an image, but it maintains temporal and spatial information. So this is an example of a trick where you could get away with video or audio insight when it comes to computer vision. Um, I love this example. So something that's already been hit on with UMAP clustering on encoders is you begin to find topics, you can tell stories. So if I build an image classifier to look at someone's face and predict which country they're from, 
if I lop off the bottom of the net and use that encoder and apply UMAP or TSNE, I can cluster those countries. And I love this example because uh, look at her face, which, which country is she from? Um, so she is from Greenland and I've got, you can see there's different countries that are grouped here. You've got Africa, you've got Latin America, Asia, Middle East and Europe and Greenland is an outlier. So looking at her face, you can determine Gr Greenland is an outlier, but you would have needed DNA studies to figure that out in 2017. Um, so using, using data robot, we can do the same thing. We didn't have to do all the programming. It's actually just supported in the product. So I can take COVID and I can look at these x-rays. There was a lot of excitement about COVID um, classification with pneumonia. Can I look at an x-ray and classify disease? Um, a lot of people jumped on this in the data science community thinking that they were going to offer a lot of value. And I don't mean to belittle that because there, it, there are opportunities to offer value. But the thing that a lot of people were missing is there was target leakage. So target leakage was coming through in the label and people didn't realize that. So they're reporting really high numbers on classification accuracy, but it was misleading because it wasn't real because the training sets were tainted. And here with this visualization in the product, you can see that these labels are being separated automatically with UMAP um, clustering in the product. So with no programming, I can immediately get this insight and protect myself from delivering the faulty news that we have a good classifier. Um, so the thing I'm pulling on now is I really want to kind of drum up the, the magic of deep learning. And I think with the other speakers, I probably did not have to do this because the, their talks are fantastic. And they really showed you that deep learning is magical. Um, but we've heard about reinforced learning and deep learning has been able to play these games, Atari, Doom, Dota 2, StarCraft. But one of the things I selfishly wanted is I wanted it to play my Xbox. And so I've been sad about this for three years where I didn't think there was a way for this to be done uh, without spending millions of dollars on custom driver development. But fortunately, I found a trick where I was able to take over a stock Xbox and control it using a GPU computer. And the game I like to play is Call of Duty. So can I have reinforced learning learn Call of Duty at these frame rates, these resolutions? And sure enough, you can. So sure enough, I can take something like this video feed. I, I had reached out to Lambda Labs. They, they sent this GPU laptop with these specs. Reached out to Intel. They sent a 12 terabyte um, server with 196 cores. And these were some of the machines I was able to use on this project to teach AI to play Call of Duty. Um, consuming the frames and the audio and predicting all the actions in real time. And with reinforced learning, it gets better over time. And the key thing is play, uh, it's learning through experience. Uh, this is some artwork we put together. Um, we we're planning this big press piece, but that actually kind of hit a hiccup in the middle of the acquisition talks. So this actually wasn't pushed out through the press, but this is my son, bottom left. He's a monster as well. He's playing AI. There's some fun ethical notes that come up from this because what is it really doing? Um, could AI be playing against you on the Xbox today? Absolutely. We demonstrated the doability last year. Um, so I'm wrapping up the talk now. So deep learning is amazing. It can do all these things, but it's shockingly dumb. So in 2015, we showed using genetic algorithms and adding noise, it's not very hard to trick any deep net to think that a cheeseburger is a bagel or a zebra or whatever we want it to think it is. Um, and so what I'm going to the bottom of the barrel right now on is intelligence. So to really answer the question of intelligence, we have to say it, it helps to ex exit human intelligence and kind of observe the animal kingdom. So a question might be asked to the audience is, is this ant intelligent? So looking at this ant and looking at what it's doing, it, I think that hopefully the reaction is no, this, this ant's quite, it's quite stupid. It's going to be killed by this human. I don't know why it's even biting. But then you see ants doing this, and you say, wait a second, this is actually pretty smart. They're intentionally building a bridge for the other ants. How, how's this happening? And one of the things we realized studying the other animals is there are really smart animals. So a crow can do certain three-stage problems that even our children will struggle to do. Why are these dolphins jumping? Well, we have animals that demonstrate behavior of play, humor, curiosity, wonder. This elephant is showing wonder looking at a seal. Uh, humor is an example of a higher intelligent behavior. 
but humans are obviously the best because we can land rockets backwards and the other animals can't. So we must be smarter. And so one of the things that we've been researching is how humans learn language. So a very young baby will learn English. And there's a lot of things that come out of going really deep on how humans learn language. And they, they open the door for all of the things that are wrong with deep learning. So th this is a much bigger topic, and we could have a whole hour-long presentation of all the pitfalls of deep learning, so I'll try to hit on some of them. So one of the interesting breakthroughs or insights, I don't think it's a breakthrough because ling linguists already knew about this, you actually can't learn a language listening to the radio. So if you listen to the English radio or the German radio, you can't learn the language. And one of the important things that happens with a child interacting with a parent or a guardian is it's learning, it's attention-based learning. So it is tracking the parent's attention, the parents interacting with it, and it, it'll learn words. And the, one of the wonderful things I like studying this is if I say the word hot dog for the first time, so assume an English child has never heard the word hot dog, I say it as a single word, a human child will actually segment that word automatically. And this is fascinating. So if you look at automatic speech recognition systems, they they can't do that. They can't hear hot dog once and separate it. They have to train on 100,000 hours of speech transcription. And even then, they have to muscle through with a language model to try to get ahead of that, to figure that out. But a child will automatically segment that. And I've got two slides left. So really what is happening is a child is doing an unbelievable job of building uh, their own language of the physical world. The things around them, the things that interact, the concept of a sheep and a dog and a house and a door and a light in parents are known before the language comes on for the ride. And so when we get into a Turing test, uh, a Turing test of that actually shows signs of intelligence. Um, this is the final slide. To pass messaging, GPT-3, GPT-10, I think, can pass the Turing test, but it doesn't. it's not actually smart. It's just a parlor trick. It's think of a, a magician. So I could convince my parents that I've created AGI this year, but no one on this meetup would agree with me. They would see through that. That's a parlor trick. And so this is kind of this proposed Turing test that I'm, I'm really just throwing out here on this meetup. Assume that you lost the concept of time and you only looked at these three objects, a field, a kitchen, and a face. Could you build a model where if I have a third eye or if I do something unusual, you actually focus in on the novelty of it and you react to that. So if there's a sheep in the field and then one day there's not, the model would immediately notice that the sheep is missing. Uh, the model would actually have a really good catalog of hierarchy and spatial relationships on size. Uh, so think of a, a faucet to a sink or a chair to a cupboard um, or a range to an oven. It would learn all of that with no labeling. So literally just staring at these images, the human brain would learn this. It doesn't have to touch the oven. It would learn this immediately where deep learning cannot. So that's the wrap up I have. I, I apologize for going over. I want to make sure we have time for questions. But the, hopefully people see that as you begin to study how a child learns a language, which is a very, very big topic, deep learning is nothing like that. Deep learning is a rail gun that is impressive, but it can fail with my dumb image in the top left, throwing an ear on my head, a deep net gender classifier would not hesitate to give me a classification of 99% male. Okay, I'll pause. Ben, thank you so much for that. Really, really entertaining, fantastic talk. Ganesh, Justin, can I get you guys just to show your faces if that's okay? We're just gonna, we just got some questions. Unfortunately, the way YouTube has set it up, the comments aren't actually coming up. I think this has been a refresh or something. I'm not quite sure what's happened to the software, but we've got a few questions via the meetup. So I'm just going to jump into them. Ganesh, if you were to fast track your success and knowledge, speaking to your younger self on computer vision, what would you do differently you know, to try to get there faster than they did before? You're on mute. Ganesh, I think you're on Sorry, mute. Ganesh, can't hear you there. You're on mute. Uh, one of the main thing is that uh, I observed like oh, uh, over the time that um, 
if you want to start with computer vision or get, become expert in, doesn't matter, computer vision, deep learning, NLP or something, the core success is not in that layer. Uh, the core success in the uh, basic level, like you understand the basic mathematics, basic probability, um, uh, something like linear algebra probability. I know everybody says that, but that really matters because um, computer vision absorbs the knowledge from different fields. So a statistician comes and proposes act to shape models. Uh, a machine learning enthusiast comes and proposes uh, support vector machines. And a uh, biology inspired machine learning person, AI person comes and says deep learning. So we borrow concepts from different people we, we, and we apply them in the same way in NLP as well nowadays. So it's important you know the fundamentals right and even though you don't learn the fundamentals right, you can go back, take your time. Um, e even though you're an expert in a software company, like you were an architect in a software industry, want to learn AI, don't go and download a model and train the model. Instead, don't feel shy and doing a course in Coursera. Okay? Uh, there's nothing wrong in going to a Coursera and doing a simple course. A course on linear algebra or probability. Nothing wrong. But once you understand those basics, you, you can appreciate that most of these advanced techniques are uh, building blocks built on top of that. And the same thing with programming, like uh, understand basic uh, object-oriented programming. It doesn't matter where you started with Python, just understand object-oriented programming, basic syntax in Linux and all. So these all things, the way they are helping you, these things will help you. So if I would have, if I can go back, uh, I could have kicked myself in my university to learn these things better, <laughs> basics better. Thanks, Ganesh. Uh, quickly to yourself, Ben, and and then Justin, the same question. Uh, I think I would try to align myself with things that I was passionate about sooner. Because I think when you're passionate about a, a project you're working on, you'll you'll invest more time and energy into it, and you're more likely to, to learn it. And so, anytime you have a school project or anything that you know, I'm thinking of school when you have some flexibility, push really hard on your advisors and your professor to try to find a project you're passionate about, even if you have to give up something to do it, because you'll that you need to be passionate and then obsessed and then you'll become great. And Justin? Yeah, uh, those are already great answers. So I guess I would add only maybe constraining curiosity a bit, uh, because if you're there's so many interesting interesting things coming up in deep learning, for example. Uh, you could spend years on NLP and years on CV and years on any other task, reinforcement learning, and probably unlikely to become a, a master in any of those one particular branches. Uh, but I think as soon as you find a niche where you can really like hit that nail directly and dive super deep into a topic, then uh, you know catch that wave and really, yeah, I think doing that as soon as possible is always a good thing. So, so Ganesh, you're looking at probably about 1 million people die per year because of car accidents. 30% of those accidents are because of inattentiveness at the wheel. And then we see people obviously die because of the Uber accident. You see other people have died from accidents in, in Tesla, uh, which is very, very sad, but a significantly small number of people compared to the, the 1 million plus of people that are actually dying, particularly in India and China as, as a main area as well. How far is regulation of autonomous vehicles and you know how, how, how quickly do you think regulation needs to catch up? And from what kind of, Elon Musk is saying, he's kind of saying we're pretty much good to go. Do you, is there a number out there, year 2023, 2025? Can I push you on a number? Do you think this is gonna happen? You you're mute. You're mute, mute again. Sorry, uh, it depends upon how do you define an autonomous car. Is Google Waymo a autonomous car that everybody can use? Uh, everybody can't buy it, and you don't want to drive it as well because with all the sensors and all, like you don't want to be the nerd guy in the street. So, uh, if you want a car with a minimalistic sensors to run autonomous drive as a, in run it in autonomous way. It, it still has five to 10 years. But if you're okay, if you, it's about um, kind of a mobile public transport uh, or a taxi service, I think very soon we're going to see these autonomous cars, at least in multi, uh, in cities like uh, New York and California, in New York and London and all. Uh, 
may not be in rural area in west of ireland but uh, yeah and another thing we have to understand is that um andrew ng once said in one of his talk that uh, roads are made, are made for human beings we never we never uh, made roads uh, keeping machines in in mind so we have to make regulations much friendlier to the machines so uh, imagine if if a light is broken and uh, if a traffic light is broken and a person is walking okay uh, imagine the difference between the as ben rightly said like a, a, no matter how much complex algorithm you put it in the car uh, does it can if the light is traffic light is broken and the person is crossing can it imagine that okay i need to brake now human value human life is very valuable i can't do that i can't hit a person or what the algorithm will do when a cat is crossing the same same street uh, when the traffic light is again not working so will the will the algorithm will again think that okay cat life is important okay but i need to save the person inside the car who is a, who is a human being so his life is more important will the algorithm make that decision or will the algorithm think like you know what cat is also a living being so i have to save it okay or, or take a risk of the human life so these kind of things uh, kind of confused situations won't be solved right now and the easiest way to solve that them is making your roads more friendly to the machines that's good thanks thanks ganesh and my final question to uh, ben ben where do you see this where do you see the market going in terms of computer vision audio nlp all coming together what what are we going to get in the next 18 months to two years i wouldn't dare to talk about three to five years i um one of the things i like to say is the principal consultant today is the free intern tomorrow so like st stuff that you know we would say oh my gosh this is principal level material and it racks our brains to do it three years from now a free intern will do it and so i think that's the wonderful and scary thing about the space we're in and justin any of your thoughts well um yeah it's hard to make predictions in this space uh if, if especially if you're in the in the business of disrupting so um yeah i would say yeah i think that's an interesting point the principal consultant will become free intern work i think uh yeah we can expect that people will be finding themselves doing work they never expect to do in in five years and uh, that might not be so bad because yeah if enough people do it we i think we'll adjust to it well i'd just like to say thank you very much for everybody uh who presented today and shared your different perspectives everything was very very thoughtful and carefully laid out for for the audience and uh, thank you so much really appreciate it have a good day thank you all thank you Thanks. bye bye, bye.